Welcome back, AP. This is chapter 15. Um, still continuing with period four of the AP time periods. And we're going to be looking at the reform of society and culture. Just to give you a general idea of the chapter overview, so we have reform movements in the early to mid-19th century, which include the Second Great Awakening, public education, women's rights, um, prison and asylum, reform movements, temperance, and abolition. Lots of key terms and lots of people to know as you will become more familiar with them when we do the reformer coffee house um, simulation. A third revolution, the Jacksonian era, changes um, politics and the American economy. Also there's a new commitment to improve the character of ordinary Americans. There is a rise of religious revivals and reform movements and many different causes and a lot of the um, focus starts going towards abolitionism which will um, continue with next unit but basically getting rid of slavery in America. So looking just at religion, most people still attended church, but were considered um, much less devout. You have two types of religious ideas that emerge during this time period. Deism, which is the rational and the logical, combined with faith, and Unitarianism, which was much more liberal. By 1800, there was an intense reaction to these religious liberalism and this is what sparks the Second Great Awakening. It began on the southern frontier all the way into the cities of the Northeast. It was even bigger than the First Great Awakening. It left many people converted and churches dividing into new sects. You have rising evangelicism where that influenced other areas of a society like prison reform, temperance, women's movement, and abolitionism. So all of these reform movements kind of are offshoots of the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening and this evangelical spread of religious revival was through um, camp meetings. 25,000 people, there was hellfire gospel and frenzied reaction. Something that it did was it boosted church membership and stimulated humanitarian reforms and missionary work. It gave power to religious sects like Methodists and Baptists, which stressed personal conversion, democratic control of church affairs, and rousing emotion. Peter Cartwright and Charles Grandison Finney were key preachers um, during the Second Great Awakening. And then there's also a feminization of religion where women become very active, uh, they lead revivals, and as a result, it gives them an entry into other reform movements of the time period. Denominational diversity, religious faiths were more fragmented. They became divided um, more and more by class, where you have wealthier conservative denominations, um, tend to fall on the eastern half of the U.S. The Methodists and the Baptists created from the fervor in the poor, less educated south and western parts of the United States. The northern and southern churches also divide over the issue of slavery. The rise of Mormonism. It was launched by Joseph Smith in the 1830s. It uh, received opposition in the med Midwest because of the cooperative lifestyle. There was some militia training that was going on, and there was charges of polygamy. Joseph Smith is killed, and Brigham Young leads Mormons to Utah in the 1840s. They, um, those that traveled to the Utah area were able to irrigate and farm, helping them to, to become a prosperous frontier theocracy where their government and their religion is closely aligned and a cooperative society. 
There's conflicts with the government um, over issues of polygamy, which meant that Utah didn't become a state until 1896. Now looking at another reform movement in society during this time period, you have a push for public education. Tax-supported primary schools were rare in the early years of the United States. This idea grew more and more between 1825 and 1850. The wealthy upper class admit that there is a need for education to provide social stability. Workers with the vote began pressuring for schools and slowly you have the little red schoolhouse emerging in um, towns across the United States. They didn't have the same public education system as we do today. Obviously, if it's just the start of the public education, so they were only open for a few months out of the year, and there was no um, teaching colleges, so there was ill-trained teachers. So in order to rectify the situations in public education, you have some reformers like Horace Mann, who was also the secretary of the Massachusetts Board of Education. Some of the things that he was pushing for with public education was more and better schoolhouses, longer school terms, and expanded curriculum. Many adopted these changes, but there still wasn't enough schools, and many people were illiterate and African Americans were denied public education altogether. The early textbooks, um, Noah Webster had, wrote The Schoolmaster of the Republic, which were reading lessons for children, and then later the dictionary. And the McGuffey readers in the 1830s promoted reading, but they also had lessons of morality and patri patriotism and idealism. Another reform in education is higher learning. Religious zeal led to the creation of small denominational liberal arts colleges in the South and West. All car colleges offered narrow tradition-bound curriculum with little intellectual creativity. The rise of state-supported universities in the South. Uh, the federal government granted land grants and these colleges were built on that property. Women still were seen as unfit for higher education, but some schools um, accepted women as early as 1836, like Oberlin College, and then Mount Holyoke was a women's college that was opened in the same year. So there becomes this rising acceptance of secondary education for women. Other educational opportunities, you have the rise of private and public libraries traveling lecturers, um, magazines that provided current events, fiction, and women's focus. Most of the reformers are intelligent, inspired idealists. They were usually inspired by the Second Great Awakening. They have these dreams or ideas of a perfect society that's free from cruelty, war, alcohol, discrimination, and slavery. And women are key in many of the reform movements, and it also sparks the beginning of the women's rights movement. They wanted a return to traditional values. Um, reformers at the time weren't really dealing with the changing industrial society. Some key reforms and reformers state legislators began to abolish debtor prisons. Um, this is where people were put in jail and prison um, for owing money. And criminal codes and states uh, began to loosen with reduced capital offenses and brutal punishments. So you're having more of the idea that um, some of the punishments that were received in, in jails or for committing crimes weren't really fitting the crime. Dorothea Dix, she um, was advocating for more humane treatment for the mentally ill. And in 1828, 
um, American Peace Society was led by William Ladd, who wanted to end war and um, start international peace organizations. Another reform movement is temperance. Um, custom and difficulties of modern life meant that a lot of Americans drank alcohol, and this in turn meant that there were a lot of accidents at work and dangers to family and uh, the home life. So as a result of this, uh, the American Temperance Society was formed in Boston in 1826. It led to the formation of thousands of other local groups. They wanted drinkers to sign temperance pl pledges, which basically was a promise that they weren't going to drink alcohol or consume alcohol. They used pictures, pamphlets, lectures, and songs to keep people away from alcohol. <clears throat> there was a divide in the temperance movement. Some advocated temperance, which is getting rid of the urge to drink alcohol, and some wanted tetalism, where the government gets rid of alcohol altogether. Neil S. Dow was the father of prohibition in the state of Maine, and a lot of other states ended up passing similar laws, but this prohibition is the um, outlaw of the manufacturing, selling, and consumption of alcohol. Women in revolt. Women were totally sub subordinate to men, both economically and politically. More women were resisting the traditional path um, of being a wife and a mother. Some were avoiding marriage altogether. The gender dif differences are emphasized. Women are seen as physically and emotionally weak, but artistic and refined. They're seen as the moral gender, responsible for keeping society good. And home was the women's sphere. That's the cult of domesticity. Some began to see home as a prison. White, well-to-do women became reformers. They demanded rights for women and joined other reformers of the age. Um, and some movements like temperance and abolitionism. Some of the key women activists are listed here. And again, we'll see more of the activities and the reform movements that these reformers were involved in when we do the coffee house simulation. The Seneca Falls Convention was held in 1848. It's basically a women's rights convention where um, Stanton reads the Declaration of Sentiments. It starts off similar to the Declaration of Independence, but it adds women uh, into the opening sentence. One resolution uh, demanded was that women get the right to vote, and basically this launches the modern women's rights movement. Utopianism across the country, over 40 cooperative Communi communistic communities established, and you have some examples listed here of those utopian communities that emerged during this time period. The start of scientific achievement before the 1840s, science had lagged in the United States. People interested in practical science or European findings. By 1840, there are some important scientists emerging. You have professors of biology, botany, who are showing importance of original research. Medicine is still very primitive. Um, and as a result, we have short life expectancies and self-prescribed fake medications and treatments. Some developments in the 1840s with some anesthetics. Some artistic achievements. You can see um, the achievements in architecture, painting, music. You also have the rise of national literature. That's uh, literature that's created by American authors. So before 1812, there was very little American fiction, and after the war, um, the literature begins to emerge more as a profession. Transcendentalism, 1825 to 1850 in New England. 
It influenced. It was influenced by religious movements um, and German philosophers and Asian religions. So it's taking idealism and and religious ideas and bringing them together. It was based on the idea that truth transcends the senses and cannot be found by observation alone. Um, there was a belief in individualism, self-reliance, self-culture, and self-discipline. Some of the most famous transcendentalists of the time period. And some of the literary talents of the time period. <clears throat> 